Talks AFP mini series. My name's Anna, I'm a Medics Academy Fellow and I'm lead of the SDOCS programme. But the reason why I'm here today is because I'm also a final year medical student who's con considering applying for the Academic Foundation programme. So today we're going to be talking about AFP applications, which I know is something that I and my peers who I've spoken to at medical school find really daunting. So I'm absolutely delighted to be joined this evening by two academic foundation doctors who have only very recently gone through the application process. So Dimitri, would you like to introduce yourself? Hi everyone, um, I'm Dimitris Karponis and I'm an academic uh, FY1 at, in Oxford and I'm currently doing dermatology at the Churchill Hospital. Thank you so much for joining us this evening, Dimitri. It's great to see you again. And I'd also like to introduce Faris. Would you like to introduce yourself? Hello, so my name's Faris. I'm currently one of the academic FY1 doctors in working in paediatrics within Cardiff, and I'm doing an academic F1 year. So I'm also supposed to be going on to ICU in December and then doing a respiratory job in April next year. That's great. Well, thank you so much for joining us, Faris. So I know that um, myself and a lot of people I've been speaking to um, are quite daunted by the AFP applications, particularly the all important white space questions. So Faris, would you mind telling us a little bit about your experience of um, answering the white space questions for your AFP application? So um, at the time that I was considering applying for uh, the Academic Foundation programme, I must admit I left writing my white space answer questions till quite late. I think I, um, I only started writing them about two weeks, I think, before the deadline. I ended up only applying for the Wales um, Academic Foundation Programme. So I only really had one set of white space uh, questions to answer. And the three questions were, one of them was asking why I was applying to the programme in the first place. The other one was asking me to give an experience about a uh, piece of research um, that I had done whilst at medical school. And the other was uh, asking me uh, to comment on a piece of leadership experience that um, I demonstrated whilst at med school. And um, fortunately at the time, I was also applying for uh, the uh, Foundation Psychiatry Fellowship, uh, which involved writing as um, a personal statement as well. So I started by looking back at that because I'd already written that personal statement at the time and sort of drawing the examples that I had um, thought of for writing that statement. And that was actually quite useful in itself. And even though everyone who may be watching this may not have applied to um, the Psych Fellowship or something similar, I would say look at whatever personal statements or whatever applications you've written in the past when you go about writing your answers to your white space questions and i think particularly for my answers regarding uh what piece of re uh, research i was um talking about and what leads leadership experience i was talking about i don't think they were particularly fussed on what you were necessarily writing about it didn't have to be a huge piece of research or a huge leadership project that you're undertaking but I think what they were looking for from the answers to the questions is this, that you were able to sort of reflect on the experience so uh, what you think went well with that piece of research with uh, your experience of working in a leadership role within a team um, what did you learn from the experience? Um, sort of what were the take home points from how that project uh, went and uh, what you think you have improved on since undergoing that project? And that's sort of the framework with which I went about answering those questions at the time. And um, it was something that looking back on that, I think is type quite time consuming and it can almost get to a point when you feel like you're editing it down and it can take quite a few evenings and quite a number of hours to get it to the point that you're happy with the answers that you produce. But I would just say to think about an experience that if you were asked about an interview, you could be able to talk about confidently without 
necessarily having to rehearse your answers if you're able to write about that and able to reflect on it quite strongly it will come across in the way that you write about it and then if you do get asked about it um about it at the interview you'll be in a strongly suited place and be able to sort of justify why you've written what you've written for your white space answers that's great thank you so much faris and dimitri what would be your kind of top tip for people who are sitting down, you know, around now to start writing their white space questions? Yeah, so I, uh, I cannot stress enough, as Faris said, white space questions are really the bread and butter of the application. It's literally everything because they cannot ask you everything on the interview. Uh, they place a lot of emphasis on white space questions and some deaneries uh, the interview isn't even a level playing field. They consider your white space questions during the interview as well. So um, my top tip definitely would be to practice, 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 rewrite and resend, send it to your peers, send it to your friends, send it to as many people as you can. Practice makes perfect. So I actually sent my Cambridge and Oxford questions to five or six people. So I'd say start early if you can so that you can make many drafts and send them to many people so rewrite resend uh faris starts upon this so i'm not going to go into explanations but use personal examples it's very important to come across as a person and not as a robot and these are hints that they might pick up on the interview so that's a double-edged sword use stuff you're comfortable about talking in the interview um, so you can lead them on to that and do not use stuff you haven't done or don't lie about things because interviewers are really good at picking this up and you may get exposed during the interview. And finally, I'd say keep a structure in mind. So as you have probably heard from peers of books, there are certain mnemonics to keep a structure like the STAR framework or the CAMP framework, which stands for like clinical, academic, management or like personal. So try and follow that. Try and make, depending on the question, a point or two, maybe three at most uh, during every question so that you're clear and you don't dilute your explanations and have a strategy on how you answer your questions. So don't repeat the same thing. So let's say you're president in one society, don't write that in all five questions. Choose the questions wisely where you're going to portray that and uh, choose another question for something else in order to show what you've learned. It's more important to show what you've learned from what you've done rather than the position you've you've held. Sorry, I could go on uh, for hours about this. <laughs> it's uh, it's really important, but yeah. <laughs> yeah, no, that's great. Thank you. I guess one um, like quite contained question I wanted to ask was, um, what would you how would you say it was best to like cut things down because i know that some of the questions have quite tight word limits um and i think that's something people find quite daunting because they're not necessarily used to writing such short you know kind of i guess in a way like showy offy pieces of writing yeah so i i think my two top tips for that um first tip is draft early and do not be afraid to you know uh, exceed the word limit. For Oxbridge, I think the word limit was 225 last year. And I remember writing 300, 350 word questions. But that's exactly what you should do because a lot of that can be cut down. A lot of that is fluff. And some of that at the end, you will decide how to rewrite and what's the most important thing to keep on. So do write a lot. And, that, and then at the end, you'll cut them down with the help of your peers, um, with the help of your peers and the help of, you know, drafts and writing and rewriting. And the second point is that less is more. So instead of uh, trying to describe 10 different skills that you gained from an experience, focus on one or two skills and hone deep in that direction. And they, they do appreciate that. That's really useful. Thank you so much, Dimitri. I guess the other thing I wanted to um, ask about, and maybe Faris could help us with this one, um, is I, from what I understand of the application process, you also have to um, show evidence if you've done certain things like, you know, you've, you've got another degree or you've done poster presentations, you've done pieces of research. So I was just wondering about how you went about kind of collecting the evidence to make sure that you could prove that you had done all of those things that you're you know, putting on your application? 
Yeah, so with applying for the AFP program that I did apply for, which ended up being only Wales, um, I was very fortunate in that it wasn't a requirement um, to actually produce an academic CV for the application um, or to provide any specific evidence actually on the interview day itself. Um, however, when I was applying for that, I wasn't aware of either of those things till I went through the application process. So I actually did prepare an academic CV and began to prepare a portfolio for the interview. Um, in terms of the collecting the evidence, I think it made me realize uh, or made me look back in hindsight and wish I was more organized at med school and sort of grouping together all the activities which I had done. Um, so if I could go back, what I would sort of recommend to myself if I had to reapply again is to just make sure that you collect evidence of all the teaching activities that you've been involved with, whether that's teaching, um, other medical school, uh, other medical students and getting uh, feedback regarding that or teaching on behalf of the society, any um, conferences that you've been to or that you've presented at, whether that be poster or oral presentations, and also uh, keeping a collection of certificates you've got for prizes. I think in general, when you're applying for the Academic Foundation Programme, they tend to always ask you for a list of all the conferences that you've presented at for both oral and poster presentations and all the prizes that you've won at med school and some of the different AFP programs uh, may have sort of certain requirements in terms of how competitive they are in that the more prizes or the more conference presentations that you do have the more competitive it makes you for that application. Um, in terms of preparing my uh, my portfolio for the interview the way I structured it was that so I had a very clear section with all the sort of evidence I had for teaching which was mainly uh, certificates that I taught on behalf of a certain society or that I taught third year or fourth year medical students this particular topic and I put that in chronological order and essentially I did the same for my conference presentations and the prizes I had uh, got at medical school and then uh, I prepared that portfolio and was ready to bring it towards the interview uh, but fortunately at Cardiff they didn't scrutinize the portfolio at all um, within the interview process but I think I looking back on it I am glad I, that I did prepare my portfolio because I think it will uh, sort of be something that you are required to do at many stages of your medical career within the future um, and it is quite useful actually sort of going through all the stuff that you've maybe done at med school or maybe done even just before med school as well and sort of put it together all in a concise, concise CV and a concise portfolio because that is actually really useful uh, when applying for speciality posts and training posts further down the line. And also when applying for jobs outside of training as well. Um, particularly that are not done through um, the online process of Oriel. If you have that academic CV and that portfolio put together quite nicely, it does set you up well for the future. Um, I do know many of my other friends who are doing academic jobs had to actually present their portfolio at interview as well. And um, when they submitted uh, what conferences that uh, they had done, what prizes they won, they were also required to submit evidence of that as well. So my advice would to be if you're going to, when you're putting in uh, what you've done on Oriel, just make sure that you have evidence to back it up um, just in case they do ask for it and make sure that you do put in the time um, to prepare a portfolio and an academic CV. That's great. Thank you so much, Faris. So both Faris and Dimitri um, have touched a little bit on um, what might happen at an academic foundation programme interview. We're not going to go too much into that today um, because we are going to talk about that in a future um, episode of the mini series. So for now, I'm just going to say thank you very much to Faris and Dimitri for joining me again. Um, and yeah, please do join us this time next week when we're going to be talking um, to some AFP doctors about what they've done during their AFP programme, what they expected and how it lived up to their expectations. Thanks very much. Hi, 
Hi, so my name is Zaid. I am an F1 in West London and I just completed the Medics Academy training and teaching day three course. I think it's structured in a really nice way with a lot of resources. You can permanently access the course isn't over after three days. You've got a ton of online content that you can always revisit and I think that is fantastic. I thought it was a great way to learn through having a full day at the start and then two later days of self-study. It really allowed for flexibility and allowed us to fully engage in the course. It also made me feel better uh, prepared to deliver teaching remotely or digitally. It's really interactive with a lot of small group uh, feedback session, exchanging ideas uh, and learning people's perspective. After actually doing this course, I realised that teaching is more of a science and it's really important to get clear feedback so that you can improve your teaching. This course also encouraged me to think thoroughly about what my audience actually wants from my teaching session and also how I can keep them um, better engaged. Really great and fantastic to get such fantastic lectures from experts in the field throughout the three days. It was also interesting to learn from others taking part on the course because we all have different levels of experience so it was interesting to gain their perspective on things too. I learned not just about a different style of teaching, um, I also learned about uh, what is medical education, how to build a career in medical education. Overall I learned a lot from the teaching course. I think it's a really well done course. I really enjoyed it. Very enjoyable. That's what I thought of the whole course, and I really enjoyed it, and I would recommend it to other people. So, thank you for letting me participate.